Thank you very much for, for coming to today's program on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Uh, we're del delighted to welcome uh, Professor Daniel Sperling uh, to the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Sperling is a senior lecturer at the Fetterman School of Public Policy and Government and at the Braun School of, he of Public Health and Community Medicine at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, he teaches courses there on bioethics, public health law, and on health policy. Uh, he holds degrees from Hebrew University uh, as well as from the University of Toronto. Um, this year, uh, Professor Sperling is a visiting fellow at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law, uh, for Health Law, Biotechnology, and Bioethics uh, at the Harvard Law School. Um, Professor Sperling has established the Jerusalem Forum for Bioethics, which is a sort of countrywide forum in bioethics uh, to organize conferences, seminars, and they're looking forward to putting together graduate programs. Um, some of his past work has included books on posthumous interests um, from a legal and ethical perspective, uh, the management of post-mortem pregnancies, and has also written on reproductive technologies, uh, transplantation, uh, justice in the health system, and other areas. Currently, uh, his current book project is working on informed consent in an era of accountable care organizations and managed care. Uh, and that, that's the issue that he'll be studying this year uh, at Harvard. Uh, so it's a great privilege to welcome him uh, to, our, to our seminar series. His topic today is organ transplantation and organ donation in Israel, recent ethical and policy changes. Professor Sperling, welcome. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, Professor Sigler and Professor Carling for this invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be here in Chicago. Okay, so uh, although transplantation surgeries are relatively successful processes and donation of organs saves lives and improves the quality of life of many people, only few are willing to donate organs for transplantation. While in many developed countries the number of willing donors has not risen significantly over the years, the numbers of people waiting for such surgeries has significantly decreased. Increased, excuse me. The discrepancy between demand and supply of transplantable organs and the health and other consequences deriving from it uh, cause a serious health policy problem that policymakers, ethicists, scholars, physicians, and others are trying to resolve for more than two decades. No wonder then that the legal framework related to the ethical, organizational, and technical aspects in the field of organ donation, most notably with, re with regard to uh, protecting the donor, establishing uh, consent for donation, and determining brain death, vary significantly within countries. One of the major reasons for unsuccessfully resolving this uh, problem lies in the fact that not enough serious research has been done to indicate what exactly are the causes and factors inhibiting and encouraging motivation for organ donation. Other than analyzing individual characteristics that may play a role in determining the likelihood of donation, such as age, gender, education level, income level, etc., of course, religious, religious associations. Uh, the literature does not offer a complete response to whether ethical, religious, or social considerations prevent the public from donating organs. Nor is it decisive as to whether it is lack of financial, emotional, or other incentives to donate that serve major obstacles. Other questions remain open. Should refusal to donate organs be explained by failure to convey the importance of donation or is it just the result of a specific and contingent legal mechanisms to allow for the extraction of organs from the dead concerning for example the requirement of consent for donation or statutory mechanisms to sufficiently acknowledge the concept of brain death the legal and ethical debates on organ donation are usually not concerned with the reasons for our willingness or unwillingness to donate organs Instead, these debates focus on two major concerns. The first emphasizes 
the benefits to the, of donation, especially to the recipient, and seeks to encourage the feeling of solidarity and altruism amongst people in the society and to increase people's volunteer identity. The other area of concern involves the creation of some incentive, usually financial, but also in the form of granting priority for medical service such as transplant, thereby increasing the motivation to donate organs for transplantation. However, both of these uh, areas of concerns are limited in their effect. Empirical uh, studies show that motivation to donate organs is influenced more by the negative att attitudes of people who oppose donation than by the positive beliefs that donors have with regard to donation. Studies also show that increased educational spending uh, co consisting of public advertisements to increase organ donation awareness among the general population, training doctors and hospital teams to improve the identification of potential donors and the way donation requests are uh, presented to surviving families is ineffective and unlikely to have any significant impact on cadaveric organ supply curves. It follows from these studies that the contribution of imposing values such as altruism or solidarity on the motivation to donate organs is relatively insignificant and that a better way to deal with refusal to donate is to refute myths and false beliefs concerning donation and the circumstances surrounding it. The debate to re re relating to financial uh, uh, incentives to donors or their family members is also limited in its effect. Such a debate raises serious moral objection and evokes weighty, weighty sentimental responses, such as, is one really uh, free to sell his or her liver or heart? Is payment not an undue or unjust inducement? Are potential vo vendors of organs truly autonomous? Do financial incentives not lead to exploitation of the poor who will sell their organs in order to survive? Do they not express disrespect for the dignity and humanity and of humanity and the treatment of others merely as means? Will these incentives not result in broadening the social gaps in society and uh, increase injustice and inequality in access to health. In addition, the, existing, uh, the existence of a commercial mar market for organs is usually located within a human trafficking framework. Advocating for financial incentives to donors may not be practical within these systems that pro prohibit commerce in organs. Finally, there is much evidence showing that existing markets in nations such as India have failed and did not result in increased successful transplant and as a result of, po uh, as, as, and as a result of poor organ conditions. To the contrary, studies show that participants in organ sales report deterioration in their health uh, status after, for example, nephroctomy. Moreover, assessment of attitudes of family members who had been asked for consent to donate organs of their relatives shows that financial incentives are less likely to make a difference in the donation decision the donor, than donor authorization. Recently, it was argued that our understanding of the motives for and motivation to donate or refuse donate organs should be a precondition to any public uh, debate on organ donation. Drawing on the social science literature, it was suggested to look into the new factors that have not been sufficiently discussed in the literature and may affect motivation or lack of motivation to donate organs. One such area cons of concern uh, relates to the symbolic meaning of the act of donation, the specific organ to be donated, and the relationship between the donor and the recipient. Recent empirical work carried out in four European countries provides substantial support for such a suggestion. Moreover, other work recently done on unwillingness to donate specific organs offers new research directions to examine the relation between attachment to different organs and one's willingness or unwillingness to donate them. Following these new theoretical understanding and empirical findings, we decided to examine them more carefully in the Israeli context. So like in most of uh, other Western countries with an opt-in organ donation policy, Israel faces the same organ uh, shortage problem, also resulting in relatively low rates of consent for donation. So as of uh, 2013, about 10% 
uh, of the adult Israeli population has signed an organ donation card. This has dropped from last year, which was 14%. While among half of the families uh, whose relatives sign uh, such a card, donation is refused upon death. And this is the, one of the major problems. So uh, you can see that all the, the number of people who uh, signed donor cards has increased in recent years. Still, the number of donations is relatively fixed and stable, and as I said, the, uh, the red and, uh, sim uh, symbolizes acceptance of donation, whereas the blue is a number of refusals. So you see still that there are more incidents of refusal to donate among those that signed uh, an organ do uh, donation card than those that accept. Uh, and you can also see that uh, there has, it is the number of transplant surgeries relatively uh, stable as well. There was a sharp decrease uh, last year, and this is due to uh, an unexpected and, and an interesting decrease in the number of brain deaths in Israel that occurred last year. This was uh, uh, a, a decrease of 16% of the incidence of brain death, and this is being investigated at the moment possibly uh, due to a decrease in the, res in, in the number of uh, car accidents that uh, we've had uh, recent years. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wait for questions in the end of the session. Is that okay? Yeah, just one Sure. Israeli law, um, it's not the same as Israeli law. Does not support the decision of a person who's dying to have his or her organs? No, it does support. It does, it does support. But they can veto this yes. previous, yeah. Um, okay, so as of uh, 2000, January 2003, uh, a little more than 1,000 people were waiting for transla transplantable organs, and the list of these people is gradually increasing every year from 2006 until 2013. The number of people waiting for uh, organs uh, increased by 45 percent from 768 to uh, 1,000 and uh, more than 1,000. On average, it takes 2.7 years and 4.3 years to receive a transplantable liver and kidney, respectively. And along with this increase uh, in the number of people waiting for transplantable organs, as I mentioned before, the number of transplant surgeries decreased. Okay, so uh, what is the public policy surrounding this area? So uh, public policy aimed at increasing donation rate includes promotion of living donations through special committees that evaluate and approve requests for such donations. According to a new law, living donors are paid by the government for 60 months of private or complementary health insurance, 60 months of incapacity to work or loss of income insurance, 60 months of life insurance, five consultation meetings with a therapist, and seven nights of recovery in a hotel, uh, and a fixed sum of about $650 uh, for travel expenses. So this, this is a very nice uh, package of uh, financial incentives, uh, and I will refer to it uh, later on. It's, it's all of those. Right? It's all of those, no, yeah. It's all, it's, it's, yeah, consecutive. Okay. Um, now, relatives of, uh, relatives of a deceased who donated organs are paid for funeral expenses, and receive free entries to national parks and museums. <laughs> Although we don't have those, the, such many as you have. Uh, but still, it, it, it can be attractive to some. Um, in addition, all sickness funds reimburse funding of transplantation surgeries outside Israel if evidence for organ trade is not found, of course. And brain death is legally acknowledged uh, despite some religious opposition, and I will refer to this uh, later on. Uh, more interestingly, uh, Israel has established a unique program in which prioritization of organ allocation is based on whether the recipient or her next of kin signed an organ donation card prior to the transplant surgery. Except for children below uh, uh, 18 or other patients who need life-saving transplantation, the program gives priority to a patient whose uh, parents Whose, um, the, uh, whose uh, parents, siblings, children, or spouse signed an organ donation card, 
and or donated life-saving organs, as well as to a patient who donated a kidney, liver, lung lobes, or that his, patient, that his parents, siblings, uh, or children or spouse donated these uh, organs. Three levels of priority uh, exist. The first class priority without a waiting period for those who they or their close relatives donated while alive. A second class of priority for those who signed a donor card. And a third class priority for those who, who, they, who they themselves have not signed a donor card, but one of their relatives did. And since the program started in 2011, uh, about 52 people uh, already had transplantation surgeries under the program. So it's, it's relatively a new program. We still don't have much data on this. This is the only data that we have. Okay, so in this presentation, I will introduce a recent study uh, aimed at pointing to some original empirical data on the complex meanings and motivations that organ donation raises and the symbolic meaning of donation. The study is based on a detailed anonymous questionnaire serving public views on the subject. The questionnaire was distributed among random and selected part of the Israeli society, including organ recipients, organ donors, soldiers, university and high school students, and the general population. It inquires about uh, respondents' personal and professional characteristics, their general intention to donate organs, and their uh, motivation and readiness to donate specific organs, their attitudes on organ donation, compensation to donors, state responsibility in the area of organ donation, and other policy and ethical issues relating to organ donations. It also queries as to their knowledge of public policy and legislation, uh, affecting organ donation uh, and transplantation, and their views on the uh, connectedness between the body, body parts, and their sense of self. So a total of almost 1,000 questionnaires uh, from various parts of the country were received, about 800 of which were found appropriate for analysis. 42% of respondents were men. Were men. Uh, most of respondents were born in Israel and raised in families with an Israeli or Eastern European origin. Respondents were uh, ranging. The respondents' age were ranging from 15 to 77. The means was 25, relatively young. Most of them single. Uh, respondents declared they were. About 85 of them declared they were Jewish. Uh, about 10% Muslims. Um, uh, when asked about their nationality, about 90% reported they were Israeli Jews and about 10% uh, Arabs. In terms of their religiosity, 52% uh, declared they were secular, 32 traditional, 14 religious, and one ultra-Orthodox. The questionnaire were collected from various geographical areas. In our sample, respondents live mostly in big or small cities. Uh, 75 of them had up to 12 years of education, 12% 12 of, uh, 12, 12 of them had more than 15 years of education, and about 47 of them were, at the time of the research, high school students. Uh, about 8% uh, were soldiers, 27% university students, uh, about 10% employers, etc. In terms of their income, about 62% had monthly income of less than 4,000 new Israeli shekels. Uh, you should understand that the average income in Israel is about 1,800 uh, new um, Israeli shekels, so it's about a quarter from that. Um, and um, in terms of their, um, in terms of their uh, health, most of them, uh, about 90% of them re reported they were generally healthy. Some had uh, preliminary heart or heart disease chronic or other diseases. In addition to the basic <coughs> universal coverage that every citizen in Israel uh, enjoys, uh, about 42% of them had complementary health insurance. And more, an additional of about 14% had uh, private health insurance. So three layers of uh, health insurance. Uh, although our sample is not fully representative, the major characteristics of respondents generally correlate to the population, to the Israeli population. So we divide our uh, findings into the following themes. So about 25 of respondents reported that they had signed an organ donor uh, card. 
Moreover, 10% of the participants in the survey had donated an organ uh, to a relative or had organ donation in their family. 6.5% of them received an organ for donation from their relatives. Of those who have not signed an organ donor card, about 60% declared they were considering or willing to sign such a card, and 39% reported they would not sign uh, such a card. Of the many factors that encourage uh, organ donation, the following factors receive the highest rankings from one to five, where one represents no influence whatsoever and five represents substantial influence. So donors' state of health receives the highest uh, effect, following by awareness of the de deficit of transplantable organs, awareness that uh, donation is crucial for saving a life, recipient state of health, precedence for the donor's family in obtaining donated organs, and donor's family proximity to the recipients. Among uh, the many factors inhibiting organ donation, the following factors lack uh, of information on donation procedure, type of organ, the position or attitude of relatives, inflicting pain and suffering on the deceased, and the perception or concept of bodily integrity received the highest rankings. In general, people who are willing to donate organs to their relatives only while alive are likely to donate to any person, including for free, after death. On the other hand, people who, while alive, are willing to donate organs to a relative and to a stranger for some compensation have a more affirmed opinion as to donations after death and are more likely to donate their organs for compensation to strangers than respondents in the first group. The difference between those two groups of respondents was found to be statistically significant. The type of uh, residence, country of birth, income level, and health status of respondents did not have statistically significant effects on motivation to donate. Willingness to donate was found to correlate to age, education, gender, and religiosity. The average age of people willing to donate organ was 28 and of those unwilling to donate was 21. The difference between these two was found statistically significant. Overall, people who were willing to donate organs were more educated than those opposing donation. This is not surprising. Education, however, had more impact on after-death donations than on living donation. People who, in addition to the national health insurance, had private insurance, whether complementary health insurance or private insurance, uh, tended to donate more than those who did not. In our study, uh, women are more likely to donate than men, uh, while a statistically significant difference between men and women was not observed with regard to living donations, women were more likely to donate organs to relatives and to a stranger for free uh, than men and were less willing uh, to donate than men to a stranger for some compensation after death. Generally, the less respondents declared they were religious, the more they were willing to donate organs. However, within respondents who uh, stated they would not be willing to donate organs, there was no uh, large difference between secular and traditional respondents. This finding may reflect a problematic uh, nature of self-reporting of religiosity level, especially in the Israeli society, whereas one can argue the cultural influence of religion on secular practices, such as practicing at the Passover Seder, uh, management of corpses, performing religious marriages, etc., is very dominant. In our, in our survey, uh, the statistically significant difference between religious and non-religious or less religious respondents is observed with regard to donations after death. While in general the first are more likely to donate organs after death than uh, the latter, our, st our study found that only with regard to donations to relatives do traditional respondents tend to donate more after death than secular uh, respondents. In general, Israeli Jews were more likely to donate organs than Israeli Arabs, while no significant difference between Jews and Arabs was found in relation to living donations. A statistically significant uh, difference was found between um, uh, nationality and motivation to donate uh, with regard to donations after death. 
A survey examined the question of whether organ donors should be compensated for their uh, donation, and if so, what is the type and the extent of compensation. While most of respondents agreed that donors should not be compensated or have not decided on this uh, question, uh, about 32 of them uh, thought they should receive some compensation. Our study revealed that women believe much more than men that compensation should not be offered uh, to donors. Around 65% of respondents would be prepared to pay any sum of an organ vital to save their lives. While some of uh, the respondents were prepared to accept uh, an organ at, an, at a reduced cost from an unknown source overseas, a large majority of respondents were not. In terms of its general contribution to organ donation, compensation was not found to be among the five factors most influencing willingness or unwillingness to donate uh, organs. While alive, only 4.5% per of, of participants are willing to donate organs to a stranger for monetary compensation. And only 7.6% of them are willing to donate with regard to a stranger after death. So these are relatively uh, little numbers. The vast majority of respondents are willing to donate organs for relatives only and without compensation while alive. And for every person, whether a relative or a stranger, freely after death. When asked about the type of compensation that participants would like to receive for donating organs, precedence in case that they or a family member should require a transplant is what most respondents prefer. And this was before the initiation of this new policy that I introduced. Uh, and this was significantly followed by money and reimbursement for expenses associated with donation. Precedence in organ transplantation was suggested more by more mature respondents and by more educated respondents than money. Uh, the vast majority of those who prefer money for donations have not signed an organ donation card. Okay, so now I move to the more to the newer uh, uh, results of these uh, research. So one of the major contribution of our study concerns the exploitation, uh, uh, the exploration of interesting associations between a person's sense of self and the symbolic meaning attached to a specific organ and the motivation to donate organs. So we ask respondents to rate their willingness to donate to various groups of recipients who were divided by their proximity to the donor. On a scale from 1 to 10, where 1 stands for I would not be willing to donate this organ at all, and 10 I would uh, be highly willing to donate this organ, we received the following results, as you can see from the table. With regard to all organs, motivation to donate in, uh, increases sometimes dramatically as you move to the right. So this is more proximate donation to a relative, a friend. So this motivation with regards to almost all organs increases as, um, as the recipient is more proximate to the donor. When asked uh, to rate various items, including organs, in terms of their closeness or link to the way respondents feel about themselves or see themselves, that is what I call the sense of self, on the scale from 1 to 5, where 1 stands for very remote from what I am and 5 from very closely linked to what I am, and when compared to the general motivation to donate organs to recipients in all categories of proximity to the donor from 1 to 10, where 1 stands for I would not be willing to donate this organ at all, and 10 for I would be highly willing to donate this organ, respondents reported the following result. So in our study, uh, the closest organ to one's sense of self, that is the way we perceive ourselves or see ourselves, are brain, facial cells, heart, genitals, vocal cords, and skin cells. These organs are followed by lung, hair, cornea, bone marrow, blood, nose, kidney, liver, and pancreas. When the closeness of organs to one's sense of self is controlled and respondents are divided, to those who regard the organs listed in the questionnaire as remote as opposed to close to their sense of self, we found a, stati a statistically significant relation between their closeness to the donor's sense of self and their general willingness um, to donate to all recipients, regardless of their proximity to the uh, recipient. So, uh, but we found this with regard to, uh, this is the table that 
uh, actually explores the general connection between uh, the scoring for uh, uh, respondents' uh, uh, rankings of closeness uh, of sense of self and their willingness to donate the uh, aforementioned uh, organs. And we find a statistically significant relationship uh, between these two with regards to the following uh, organs, the genitals, uh, vocal cords, heart, lung, liver, cornea, and skin cells. So it follows that in general, organs that are closest to uh, one's sense of self, i.e. genitals and skin cells, produce the strongest relationship. In our study, we also examine whether there is a difference in respondents' willingness to donate organs by their proximity to the recipient, depending on the contribution of specific organs to one's sense of self. When respondents are divided to those who regard the organs listed in the questionnaire remote as opposed to those uh, to close uh, to their sense of self, we found that there are statistically significant relationship uh, between the closeness of organs to one's sense of self and their willingness to donate, but that these relations apply to different recipients depending on the organ to be donated. So here you can find uh, statistically uh, significant uh, uh, relations with regard to the following organs, but this starts only from a specific proximity from to the recipient. Yes. What, just a, a clarifying question: By genitals, do you mean sperm and eggs, or do you mean uh, you know, ovary? Uh, ovary. ovary. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ovary yeah. Itself. Yeah. So it's like a, an hypothetical situation in which you could donate these, uh, of course. So, so yeah. No, I did. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that these that, the, that it varies, okay, uh, from which point the statistically significant relation exists with regards to uh, correlates to the um, proximity to the donor. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is also reflected in the following uh, in the following table. <coughs> okay. So uh, remoteness from the uh, from the donor was also found to be impacted by the weight one attaches to the type of organ in encouraging or inhibiting motivation to donate. Hence, the more respondents regard the type of organ as significant to their willingness uh, to donate organs, either as encouraging or inhibiting donation, the more it will affect their likelihood to donate organs to a stranger. And in most cases, this will be a negative effect. With regard to donation to recipients who are close to the donor, the importance that the donor attaches to the type of organ, either, e either as encouraging or inhibiting uh, donation, does not play a significant role as to their motivation to donate. The questionnaire examined participants' familiarity with three major policy frameworks affecting organ donation in Israel. That is Israel's Organ Transplantation Act, Israel's Brain Tr Respiratory Death Act and the position of the Chief Rabbinate on Organ Donation After Death, published in uh, 1986. Our survey revealed that between 57 and 69 percent of respondents are not familiar with any of these policy documents and that the largest por proportion of respondents familiar with them Re, uh, relates to the rabbinical uh, position, while a less significant number of people are familiar with both pieces of legislation. Secular respondents were more familiar with the Brain Respiratory Death Act than traditional or religious uh, respondents, maybe paradoxically because this act is aimed more at religious uh, parties than at secular parties. For those who are familiar with any of the policy documents, these documents made no difference in their willingness to donate organs in many of the, resp of the uh, respondents. Among the three policy documents, the Organ Transplantation Act recreated the largest effect on willingness to donate organs. And the rabbinical position had the largest effect on unwillingness to donate organs. So uh, in conclusion, surveys made in Israel prior to our study in indicated that more than 50% of the public is willing to donate organs in exchange for prioritization in organ allocation, a much greater proportion than those choosing direct or indirect financial compensation. Although ethically dis disputable, the new national in initiative for prioritization of organ allocation may receive further support from our study.
However, the very low impact of uh, monetary compensation on motivation to donate organ demonstrated in the study should call into question the other legal and policy uh, channels seeking to increase motivation through payment to donors, although in the guise of reimbursement of expenses. I say in the guise because it's, uh, it's a fixed sum of money. You don't have to submit receipts, it's just you, pay, you, you are paid as, as a, f uh, a fixed amount. Previous studies suggest that institutional framework and more specifically governmental settings and regulations in the form of legislation affect people's attitudes regarding a uh, donation by reshaping the culture in which they live. However, these studies were challenged by more recent articles also referring to an inverse association between the depth of information or knowledge about medical practices and processes involved in organ donation and the attitudes and willingness to donate. As a, as an, a Dutch uh, a scholar argued, by enforcing le legislation to maximize organ donation and transplantation activities for special interest groups, organ donation ideology reforms traditional sociopolitical concepts. Such legislation may come at the cost of limiting people's liberties and undermining established cultural and religious views. More generally, as in the Netherlands, a study indicates that the impact of legislation on the increase of donor uh, organ supply can be very limited. Most of the public is unaware of legislation or is skeptical about its weight in shaping deeply rooted values that play a role in constituting one's motivation to donate or not donate organs uh, to others. <coughs> our findings suggest shifting our attention from the impact of social feeling, including through social interactions on motivations to donate organs to a more self-centered approach stemming from a donor's perception of his or her self and the symbolic meaning one attaches to the act of donation and to the organ at stake. While previous studies concerning willingness and unwillingness to donate specific organs focused on an associated donation with disfigure, disfigurement of the body, our study provides a more original way to think of the role of body parts in determining our sense of self and the symbolic meaning we attach to our body and our organs in shaping our willingness or unwillingness to donate organs to others. Finally, one has to caution against the rhetoric of scarcity of organs. When such rhetoric turns to scarcity and anxiety, as Leslie Sharp puts it, the focus on shortage of organs may neglect the role and responsibility of the transplant industry in generating its own patients, a process that it in turn increases the demand for organs. A promising way to do this would be to rethink the impact donation has on the selves of donors and their families and on the symbolic meaning of the organ to be donated. This may pave a more promising route for public policy in this area. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a, a terrific talk. And an area I think that uh, we now have a lot more insight than, than we had uh, at the beginning of the hour. Um, it's great to, to, uh, to get information about a whole different uh, uh, society and culture and, and how they look at organ donation. I guess the, the, um, the first question would be, do we have any indication yet on how successful uh, a lot of the, the recent changes have been? So again, what, what uh, we have like about 50 cases of these uh, priority of allocation uh, and so uh, we know that these uh, policy allegedly increase the number of people that assign, but unfortunately, as I as I stated at the beginning of my lecture, uh, these policy don't uh, policy uh, alternatives have yet to change the refusals rates that we have for those that sign the don the the donor card or their families, of course. So, at at the moment, uh, that we don't have much uh, data on this. Um, and as, as I show in my uh, research, I think that the uh, Israeli public does not support the idea of compensation. So it is like it's not connected with the policymakers' uh, initiative to try to make an incentive. So 
if if my results will if your uh, if your results are correct, yeah. there won't be any, a yeah. significant impact. No. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, it's yeah. a it's a very it, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it will be investigated. In, in, yeah. In, yeah. Over time, you'll yeah, know whether sure. whether the respondents of your mm -hmm. survey were telling the truth or not. Yeah. Um, which will be interesting. Um, you know, several years ago, uh, Illinois and now most of the states went through the process of a first person consent, saying that the the donor card that they signed is a legal document in terms right. of consent and that families uh, don't have the right to, to overturn that. Mm -hmm. Has there been any um, push of the, that towards in, There was in a bill a few years ago trying to uh, to make an opt-out system to make it easy. Well, this is, this is, to check. This, this is this is still an opt-in, but but allows allows that to or disallow uh, people uh, pay, uh, family like, members a, to it's veto. A, it's a fully yeah. enforceable consent. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm not aware of such a try, but even th this attempt to change our legislation to make it an opt-out, uh, receive such a public. Uh, yeah, I, I don't uh, think opt-out is yeah, going to work here no, either. But this was yeah. kind of the middle ground of a you know if you sign. Yeah, I know. Then that's a it's a legal document. Yeah, it was no. So uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Sperling, for your, for your uh, presentation. I have two questions. I was hoping you can kind of make sense for two things that you mentioned here. One, you mentioned early on that uh, there is an increased incidence of family members uh, who people, uh, first person consent, quote unquote, people are willing to donate, but family members are reticent to do so right. when it actually decisions, time to make decisions at hand. The survey that you performed here seems to be amongst people who are high school students, university students, and soldiers. So much, a much younger population. Uh, you said that's reflective of the Israeli society at large, right. but those are the people who might get in a car accident, right, and then think that they want to donate, but right. actually they're not the ones who are making the decisions when the time has come. It's right. their family members. So how far can we take the implications of your study right. knowing that it's not, they, it's not their choice at that point? In the description of my sample, so age was, uh, indeed the average age was 28 which is uh, higher than soldiers for, or, or high school, um, uh, but it ranges. So um, you, are, you are correct that this uh, sample is relatively um, maybe underrepresentative uh, in terms of the age, okay? But if you start with uh, this education at school, in high school, and then it goes to the army, and, and you should be aware that in our system, because um, uh, um, military service is compulsory, so, you, uh, so the um, the the uh, thinking about death and about uh, about donation is very actual. It's something very concrete for these ages. Okay, and they discuss it with their family members. So it's maybe different than other cultures where the um, uh, closeness to the idea and, and the possibility of, of being endangered. In a, in, a, in a battle or in a terror attack. Uh, and also, you know, the, I'm now saying about terror attack because it affects everyone, like adult people as well. So the immediacy of death in Israel, if I, if I can uh, call it this way, I think uh, constitutes uh, the same kind of reasoning. And I think it should also uh, tell us about, uh, about the way that uh, adult people will re, uh, will um, respond with regards to a request in real time. You know, the, the, when you brought up the aspect of the compulsory um, military. military service, um, it, it brings. I I, I want to get a little bit more information on what the public's. You said it, there was a negative public reaction in terms of a of an opt out donor system. Yeah. Um, you know. It, you know, in the states, we we kind of say the only thing that is certain is death and taxes, um, and we don't have the compulsory medical. I mean, compulsory military stuff, um, and so the state is requiring all the young people to go into the military to um, protect and defend Israel. Um, wouldn't it be an, just another level of protection of the citizens to mandate that they donate organs, so an opt-out system. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, a radical <laughs> um, <laughs> shift or, you know, um, 
because you, of course it's it's another kind of demand that you're you're asking uh, people, and there's a question as whether the state should you know go that far to interfere within people's liberties. Um, so one can still um, contribute to the you know to the society by joining the army. Um, um, but I think to ask everyone to like like to, to shift to an opt out would be would be too far. Uh, in this respect, um, I think there's also uh, this thing that is also reflected in, in, in my research about the sense of the body and, and what it, and, and, and the closeness uh, one feels to one's body. Maybe maybe um, that has to be something with uh, religion, although most of the Israeli society is not religious, still. Um, but uh, the connection between religion and culture and the societal values that are shaped and constituted within the Israeli society is a very close connection, is a very tight connection. So it affects also secular uh, uh, people in Israel. I didn't quite understand what you meant by facial cells. And were you talking about face transplant itself? Yeah. Versus face cells, which would be like skin cells. I'm not sure I understood that. Facial, yeah. Facial, so face transplant. Yeah, face transplant, yeah. yeah. We, we had a conference, uh, excuse me, last summer in which we had several folks from Israel came who uh, study or are active in the intersection of Judaism and, and medicine. They commented that in Israel, although the nation is largely a it's pretty secular uh, yeah. people, um, that the Jewish, uh, the, 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 the religious scholars have a disproportionate influence in the shaping of policies regarding medicine. And I wonder, and you, you alluded to these being closely connected. Is that going on here as well, in that the, that the policies such as opt-out are, would be more accepted by the general population, but that the religious, uh, yeah. the, the religious th leaders yeah, have more influence? Yeah, I think, I think this is correct. I mean, I think uh, more generally, um, and also to the, I think to a great surprise, the religious uh, party, although they, parties, although they have a little uh, share in the in the in the Israeli population, they have a larger impact on bioethical discourse more generally. This is also reflected in reproductive ethics and and uh, other issues as well, uh, and also in in this area. And it starts first of all with the definition of death, because Israel has a very, I would well, this is my criticism, but again, a, a very bizarre <laughs> way of acknowledging brain death. First of all, the, the, the title of, of our legislation is Brain Respiratory uh, Death Act, which um, puts a lot of emphasis on the cessation of uh, respiratory uh, functions and uh, requires objective testings and the uh, specific machines and testings to be uh, for uh, the determination of brain death. Um, another thing that you can you can uh, say that reflects the impact of religious parties is that uh, from this new legislation, which was uh, 2008, uh, now until this new legislation, uh, every neur neurologist or physician could have uh, declared brain death, you know, having completed the specific testing. But from the, from 2008 onwards, now only specific uh, physicians who are trained by uh, committee, a specific committee, will be allowed to determine brain death. And now then you ask, so who is in the committee? So in the committee, there are 10 people, three of whom are rabbis. And of course, this created a lot of uh, uh, tension, <laughs> I would say it elegantly, uh, in the medical profession, because they say, why should we be trained by rabbis how to determine death? Do they, can they teach us, you know? So it took a while until they, they passed the law, just because of that, but it passed. Um, another, I think, example for this impact would be that our uh, legislation, the Brain Respiratory Death Act, also uh, empowers family members to dispute the determination of brain death. So family members can access or can request and access the data of these testing, okay, and go to another physician, okay, that's fine, but they can go to a rabbi 
and show him this data. And allegedly, the rabbi can say, well, I don't, I'm not impressed by this data. And they can come back to the hospital and say, we should ask you to continue put this person on a life sustaining support. Um, so here, I mean, here, I think New Jersey is also the same, uh, yeah. So, yeah, but other than that, so I, I think you can see these, these, uh, these uh, points where, where such an influence is very, very uh, big. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused about your answer previously, because on yeah. a previous slide, you have 28.11 was the average. But on a previous slide, didn't you have 46 point something people who were in the age group between, as I recall, 16 and, yeah, no, the previous, a previous slide, where you listed the no, people who were, yeah, 46.9% um, 16 to 18. Right. I, I, so I, I, I guess I just don't quite understand how you got such a, a much higher median age range when you had that high a, a percentage of those between 16 and 18. I, I really appreciate your explaining because more, more the than nearness to death or, or the awareness of, of risk as, as a maturing component of people's decisions at the time. But I, I wonder if getting back to my earlier question about um, which you said Isra Israeli law supports the family's ref, you know, refusal right. uh, to do what the patient has asked. Does that carry over to what we call in this country advanced directives in general, that the family is always able to override what no. the, the patient stipulates? No. In terms of uh, uh, advanced directives, and um, so, no, it doesn't go that far. It doesn't only go. When the it's is dead. Yeah, it's only when the patient is dead. Uh, and Israel has a recent uh, law on uh, end-of-life issues that validated the effect of advanced directives. But there you have full uh, validation by the authority of the person who initiated, who completed this advanced directive. So, yeah. Um, so in the United States, you, uh, if you donate a kidney, you're then no longer eligible to enroll in the army? Um, or you can actually donate a kidney while you're in the army, but if okay. you've already donated, they're not going to take you. With mandatory service, I right. wonder if there's any consideration that people have to donate after mandatory service, or it's, it's not an issue in Israel. Um, no, it's not an issue. It's not an issue, and I would I would doubt that we we have such a similar rule saying that you know if you donated, you, you're not uh, allowed to, uh, even if you wanted to. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. It's not a consideration. Uh, no, but they go to the army from in the age of 18. So, but they're eligible. But they're no. But yeah. But they can. But they can donate while in the army. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. I was struck by the centrality that you attribute to the concept of sense of self, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how that is being used and defined. Okay, so uh, it hasn't been used as a find yet because these are new findings, and as you see, it's a, quanti it's a quantitative uh, research, so it's, it's, I think it should be followed up by a qualitative research to explore more, maybe with focus groups, uh, on, on the meaning of, of this sense of self and, and the attachment uh, that one uh, places on, on one's body, uh, uh, body parts and, and their, their role in uh, the shape of the way they see themselves. But uh, so, yeah, so these are the, yeah, the findings that we we'll have so far. Uh, we've heard a lot about um, the buying and selling of organs in Israel. Right. Um, did, did the law in 2008 result in a decrease in, in that practice? Yeah, totally. Like the, one of the good things that the law did was uh, to better enforce um, the uh, commerce that was done outside Israel, not inside Israel. Yeah. Inside Israel, uh, we don't have evidence for that. Well, I don't know. Uh, just heard the story by someone in Harvard about something going on in Cleveland uh, Medical Center. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, 
you know, at least uh, with regard to the Israeli, uh, um, so, but what, what the law did was uh, uh, prohibited the reimbursement of transplant surgeries that were done outside Israel unless you prove that there's no commerce, that there, it's, it's, first of all, it has to be like in a respectful uh, medical institution and, and they're val reviewing lots of documents and so, and this wasn't before. So, um, yeah, and, uh, and, and another thing that the law did was to create these uh, criminal offenses with regards to trade in humans for uh, organ sale and, and, uh, and even an offense to buy or sell uh, an organ, although uh, they cannot be prosecuted as opposed to Singapore, for example, where they can prosecute the seller of an organ as well. So. Very interesting. It's getting uh, to one o'clock. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank a, you. Very interesting talk. Thank you.